if you all have some questions, you all can come down and visit with me. And uh, I guess for those that are in uh, Puerto Rico, my email is mahew at tmslaw.tsu.edu. It's uh, Maurice Hugh, the first two initials, my first name, HEW, Health Education Welfare, Thurgood Marshall School of Law, Texas Southern University, EDU. So if you have some questions down in Puerto Rico, you can send me an email. That's not going to be an issue. So uh, we're going to go through this really fast. Bonds and detentions. Now, uh, when representing a client in removal proceedings, I think you might first encounter the client in an immigration jail. Now, when I say jail, you have to remember the government doesn't consider it to be a jail. They say it's a civil detention. So I think the politically correct term that the government says that it's a processing center. But I've been there, and I guarantee you it's a jail. Uh, there's barbed wires there. There's fences there. You're trapped. You can't get out. It's a jail. Okay. Um, you're probably going to have a, a friend or a family member or a loved one that's going to contact you and says, my family member, my loved one, whatever is in, in the immigration jail. Now, what I usually do is this, is I, I get a confidentiality agreement signed first. Because I'm like, well, okay, who's the client? Is the client the loved one that's out or the person that's in? So if this person that's out is the one that's paying me, you know, 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks or whatever to go visit the guy in the jail, I want to be able to come back and say, okay, look, I visited the guy in jail who might be really my client, and I come back and tell a family member what happened. Because, of course, they're going to want to know. But the thing is that you don't want to be in a situation where you go visit the guy in the jail, this is the guy that out paid you, and you come out and say, okay, look, I can't tell you what happened because he's my client, not you, even though you're the one who paid me. Okay, so usually I like to do is get a confidentiality agreement before I go into the jail and visit with the individual. Now, when I say uh, removal proceedings, um, I'm also talking about pre-removal here. Now, um, you have a four corners of a piece of paper, judge signs an order, says order of removal. Now, part of the lecture is, is this bonds and detention before the judge signs an order or after the judge signs an order? Okay? Now, it's a difference, and you're going to learn, you know, later down in, in, in this lecture why, why there's a difference. Okay? So, you need to figure out whether your client's in pre-removal or post-removal, pre-order signed or post-order signed. Now, every uh, individual that's in the jail is assigned to an immigration officer. The immigration officer is supposed to talk to you if your client is a client. Now, uh, I'm going to give you a phone number, too. It's 281-449-1481. Uh, so if you're here in Houston, that's the phone number of the jail. So you can call that number, and there's an automated system, press zero, and you can actually call it and see if your client is actually there. Because what's going to happen is that uh, ICE has an immigration jail here, a processing center here, but they also use the local and federal facilities. And I've also have, have also driven like six hours to Newton, Texas, if anyone knows where Newton, Texas is, because instead of housing my client here in Houston, they actually moved my client to Newton, Texas. Now, after the most recent Ike hurricane, they actually moved a couple of our clients to Miami, our clinic clients that we're representing here in Houston to Miami. So what I would do is I'd actually call the facility first to make sure the client is actually there, because maybe the client's not there. And then when you call the facility, you need to ask the facility what you as an attorney actually need to get into the jail to visit with the client. Now, some places might say, well, look, you need to send a letter to the warden 48 hours in advance or two days in advance and say, look, I'm an attorney. I'm representing this individual. I'm coming, you know, on such and such a day, such and such a time. Uh, in advance, so they know that you're coming. Okay. Now, um, when you do visit the client, I would be prepared. And when I say prepared, is that you need to bring whatever documents that you might need to have the client sign, because this might be your first and only time to visit with the guy in jail. Now, when you're representing an individual in, in, in the immigration proceedings, you need to have what's called a notice of appearance sign, or what we call a G28. Okay. Now, what I also frequently do is, as I might have them sign a power of attorney to. Now, a power of attorney basically is that maybe you have one spouse in the jail, one spouse out of the jail, and the spouse inside the jail is the one that has his name on the bank accounts. It might be the one that has his uh, name on the car, name on the house. And the thing is that they might actually need to sell the house, sell the car, get money out of the bank. They actually pay the bond. And maybe the person outside, the spouse, doesn't have the authority to do that. Of course, you also want to get paid too, 
So maybe you want to get a power of attorney signed and say, okay, look, I'm going to give my spouse access to be able to get money out of the bank to pay me as attorney as well as to pay the bond. Okay? Now, generally, a, uh, and this is going to get into the law a little bit now, uh, individuals that are, are entitled to bond, okay, you're entitled to a bond unless you're a terrorist or a national security threat under 236A of the uh, Immigration Act, or if you've been convicted of certain crimes under 236C of the Immigration Act, okay, or if you arrive an alien. So you're entitled to bond unless you fall into those three situations. You're a national security threat or a terrorist, you've been convicted of certain crimes, or you're arrive an alien. All right? Now, I'm going to kind of gloss over security threats, and, um, and I want to more or less concentrate on, on, on crimes and uh, arriving aliens. Um, now, what's the threat to an arriving alien? Now, uh, an arriving alien is defined in these regulations, okay, HCFR 1.1Q, Q is in Queen, and it's also found at HCFR 1001.1Q. Now, for those of you who've actually looked at the regulations before, HCFR 1001 up to 1000, so less than 1000, is actually Homeland Security regulations, and 1000 or more is the Office of the Executive Immigration Review, which is the Immigration Courts. So the Homeland Security and the courts actually use separate regulations. 1000 or more is the court, less than 1000 is, is the uh, Homeland Security, but they have similar or same definitions of what of an arriving alien is. Now, an arriving alien, once again, is the individual who's not entitled to bond, okay? And simply, uh, an arriving alien is an individual that's an application for admission. So the individual's knocking on the door and saying, please let me in. So if the individual's standing outside the country, trying to come in, they should be considered to be an arriving alien, okay? Now, that's the person who's physically trying to stop on the door and say, please let me in, right? Now, an arriving alien can also be an individual that's physically in the United States. For example, an individual that's in Houston, and they're getting placed in removal proceedings. Maybe they don't necessarily have their lawful status yet. So basically, the government could consider them to be an arriving alien as well. Okay? So you could be an individual physically standing outside the country, or you could also be an individual standing inside the country, technically knocking on the door in either situation, so they don't have lawful status yet. So basically, they can be considered to be an arriving alien. Now, one of the things that I think that uh, beginning attorneys or, or even some immigration attorneys, they have not been able to make this distinction, is that a lawful permanent resident, okay, lawful permanent resident, this is the one who has their green card, okay, they also can be considered to be an arriving alien. Not in, if they're inside the United States. If they're outside physically, knocking on the door and saying, please let me in. A lawful permanent resident alien who has the right to lawfully reside and stay in the United States, if they find themselves physically outside the United States, knocking on the door and saying, please let me in, they can, can be considered to be an arriving alien. Now, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. But that's the way the laws are. So to give you an example, say you have a lawful permanent resident. This is 2008. 20 years ago, they were, were caught for possession of cocaine or something like that. Uh, 1988, conviction for cocaine. They find themselves, I guess, along the border. They say, okay, my palate, I really want to get some really good authentic Mexican food. I'll go to lunch. I go to lunch for maybe a one hour lunch, try to come back across the border, knock on the door, please let me in. How do you want to come in? I want to use my green card. I'm a permanent resident. I want to come in. Bam, you got an old conviction. Still valid for immigration purposes, regardless of time. Uh, under 101A13C, you're an arriving alien because you're an application for admission. Now, I've actually had a situation like that where I had a had a judge. Okay, judge, my guy's in the jail. Uh, he's a permanent resident. He's been a permanent resident for 20 years. I just need a simple 15-minute hearing to seek cancellation or for 212C to allow him to come back in or technically to get out of immigration jail. 
Yes, sir. Uh, you referred here to the reentry doctrine, right? The, the old well, Flutie. No, the, the old, you have the old Flutie doctrine. And the Collado. Uh, the old Flutie doctrine, which mm -hmm. is a Supreme Court case. Unfortunately, I don't have the site for y'all. But they I can get it for you. They have the, the, You have a Board of Immigration Appeals case, which kind of changed the old Flutie doctrine. It's called Mata, uh, Munoz or Collado. And then there's also by statute under 101A13C, it says that if you're a permanent resident alien and you fall under one of these six subsections, and one of the subsections that I'm describing to you is that an alien who has a previous conviction, basically the individual leaves the United States, even though he's a permanent resident alien, he's an applicant for admission, he's an arriving alien, he's trying to come in, please let me in, he's an arriving alien, bam, no bond. Okay? So you have a loved one inside the United States, say, look, look, this is the grandfather, this is the grandkids, he's been here for 20 years, I don't understand, he did his time, this criminal conviction, he just went to lunch in Mexico. He just wanted to get a little better food down there, okay? Well, still, okay, uh, there's no bond. Or he's not entitled to ask them for a bond. So you can arrive an alien, an immigration judge does not have jurisdiction to grant you a bond. Okay? Now, a lot of the immigration attorneys in the city do not, cannot comprehend that. But if you're a permanent resident alien, you can also be an arriving alien, and as an arriving alien in removal proceedings or an arriving alien seeking admission, basically um, the immigration judge does not have jurisdiction to, uh, to grant your bond. Now, there's also a uh, Supreme Court case out there, and it's called the Moore versus Kim. It's a uh, 123, and um, you know Supreme Court case. It's 1708, and that was actually in 2003. <coughs> And what the Supreme Court said, that mandatory detention of a lawful permanent resident during a removal proceeding, during removal proceedings or prior to the judge signing the order is constitutional. Okay? So mandatory detention, no eligibility for bond, is ridiculous. The situation I was describing to you is a guy was 20 years PR, had a conviction 20 years ago, Judge, I need a 15-minute hearing. She, she would not give me a court hearing, so my poor client, who's a law firm resident, sat here in Houston in immigration jail for eight months. Eight months until she finally says, I got 10 minutes to, to accommodate you, Mr. Hugh, to have this hearing. And he, after that eight months, 10-minute hearing, boom, he gets out. Okay? Now, for some of those that are looking at, okay, um, it's constitutional. Okay, now I'll give you another case. It's uh, Shaughnessy uh, versus the United States. It's, it's usually referred to as the Mezai case. And it's uh, 345 U.S. 206, 1953. And basically, you have no constitutional right to a bond if you're an arriving alien or if you're an inadmissible person stopped at the border. Okay, and that's where that all flows to. So if you're a permanent resident standing outside, say, hey, please let me in. You've got an old conviction under 101A13C. Basically, you're not entitled to a bond. Okay, and plus under the war, it's constitutional for mandatory detention prior to the removal here, or prior to the judge signing the order. Now, if an immigration judge is divested or if the jurisdiction is precluded, uh, can the service or immigration customs enforcement issue a bond? Yes. Okay, so this might be your, your exception or your out. Okay. Uh, pursuant to INA section 236A2A, um, the service or ICE can actually issue your client a bond of at least $1,500. $1,500 a floor, so it's going to go up from $1,500. By statute, $1,500 is the minimum that they can release you on. And they can also uh, allow your client to get out of jail based on what's called conditional parole. And that's found at INA section 236A to B. Now, how do you do that? You go and see the FOD, the FOD, or the field office director. Now, here in Houston, we have a FOD or a field office director. That's, his, that's the acronym. We immigration attorney said, you go and see the FOD. And basically, you can go and ask the FOD, not the FODs. You can ask the FOD what the, uh, you know, you can beg the FOD for a bond for your client. But once again, if the judge can't, give your client a bond because he's, in, because he's an arriving alien. The FOD can give your client a bond 
if he's not a security threat or a terrorist threat, or if he's been convicted of certain crimes under 236C. Okay? Now, 236C, all right? The Attorney General shall, mandatory, shall take into custody any person who has committed two or more crimes of moral turpitude, aggravated felonies, drug crimes, firearm offenses, miscellaneous crimes, crimes involving moral turpitude where the sentence of the prison is at least one year, terrorist activity, etc., etc. Just about everyone's going to fall under that. Okay? So you think. Okay, there's a, there's a couple um, exceptions that I think that you need to be aware of. Uh, the first one is that matter of uh, identity. It's a, it's a Nigerian name, uh, for butchering name, sorry. It's A-D-E-N-I-J-I. -I. It's found at 22 IN, the decision number 1102, Board of Immigration Appeals, 1998. It's also the interim decision number 3417, so you can find it under either one of those. And basically what identity says is that 236C, which is the mandatory detention um, prior to the removal order for having committed certain crimes, is not applicable to individuals who were released from custody from the underlying criminal conviction prior to October 9th of 1998. Okay, you got that? <laughs> no? Okay. So you commit a criminal offense that falls under 236C, the Attorney General shall take you into custody, okay, not eligible for bond, shall take you into custody, okay, but the law wasn't made retroactive. The law was only, act, only applicable to individuals who were released from custody from the underlying criminal conviction, okay, uh, after October 9th of 1998. So what it means is this, is that if you're, you're, the situation I'm describing to you, I purposely gave you a hypothetical, my client was convicted 20 years ago, okay, so his conviction would proceed October 9th of 98, okay, if he was released from custody for the cocaine conviction, he'd be eligible for a bond. Now, I changed the facts a little bit in that if he's an arriving alien, he's First of all, he's not going to be eligible for a bond. Okay, so in this situation, he was knocking on the door trying to come in. Arriving alien, he's not going to be eligible for a bond. Okay? If he's inside the country and the government is trying to remove him, okay, he's eligible for a bond if he was released from custody prior to October 9th of 98 from the underlying criminal offense. But if the underlying criminal offense, if he was released from custody after October 9th of 98, then he's going to be subject to the mandatory detention under 236C. Okay. When was 236 adopted, 1996? Well, what happened was that 236C was, um, was enacted by Congress on September 30th of 1996 with double IRA, which is basically your Immigration Amendment Act, right? Now, in double IRA, there was also a provision that if the Attorney General uh, advised Congress that there was not enough jail space, then 236C was not going to be applicable until AG says, I have enough jail space. So what wound up happening was that there were two extensions, and then the AG finally advised Congress that on October 9th of uh, 19, uh, uh, 90, uh, 98, um, we have enough jail space. So that's the difference between the enactment of the act and the actual date of the regulations. Right. So what happened was that uh, double IRA went into effect on September, I'm sorry, let's back up. Congress passed, a Republican Congress passed, with Clinton being a, de a Democratic president, passed these harsh, horrible, draconian rules on September 30th of 96. These rules went into effect on April 1 of 97, but in here basically said, well, AG, if the AG comes and tells Congress or tells us that there's not enough jail space for 236C to be applicable, then we'll give you an extension. And finally, the AG came to uh, Congress on October 9th of 98 and basically says, we have enough jail space now. So that's how October 9th, 98 wanted to be in a magical date. So October 9th, 98, if your client was released from the underlying criminal 
conviction prior to October 9, 1998, not subject to mandatory detention under 236C. Then, of course, what the question becomes is, what is release from custody? I have no idea. Okay? Uh, I've actually been fortunate to have actually won that particular case, but I've had other government attorneys that basically come and said, okay, client was convicted maybe in 1988. The judge gave it, was never in physical custody, but maybe the client was given, I don't know, 12 years of probation. 12 years of probation is going to be after our magical October 9th of 98 date. So even though he wasn't in physical custody, judge, he was in provisional custody, meaning that he still had to go report to the probation officer. He still had to uh, refrain from using certain alcohol and drugs, couldn't carry a firearm, had to do his reports to the probation officer. So even though he was in physical custody, he was still in provisional custody, such that um, the mandatory detention rules applied to him. Even though his conviction was uh, in 1888, he wasn't released from underlying criminal custody until after. Fortunately for my client, judge didn't buy that argument. But I have spoken to some other immigration attorneys in, in the country where that release from custody has not been defined completely, and the government attorneys have won in some cases. Okay? All right. Now, um, matter of matter of Patel. Here, let me, let me say something, Professor. I, I want to make sure they understand that you have made it easy by talking about crimes, moral turpitude, but in the code it actually refers to bisection. Right. So you almost need to they need to sit down and read the code and figure out what 212A2 is, 237A2A2 2A2 is, because you, you mentioned it, um, but they need to do that, right? Right. Okay. Right. right. I guess in some parts my job is spoon feed you yes. guys. If you read the statutes under 236C, like Professor Clones basically saying that they're going to give you a list of the statutes. And basically what I did is instead of telling you, I told you what the statutes mm -hmm. basically are. Ag felon, crime involving moral, moral turpitude, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Can you list them again? Sure, 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 sure. Aggravated felony? Sure. Uh, persons committed two or more crimes of moral turpitude, individual who's an aggravated felon, drug crimes, firearm offense, miscellaneous crimes, crimes involving moral turpitude, where sentences of imprisonment is at least one year, and terrorist activities, which I think is just all criminal convictions, just about. So if you got a conviction after October 9th of 98, or if you're released from underlying custody after October 9th of 98, even if you're a lawful permanent resident and you're not knocking at the door, basically you're not going to be entitled to a bond. Okay? But in the case that you are entitled to a bond, what are we looking at? We're going to look at matter of Patel, P-A-T-E-L, which is 15 INN decision number 666, and it's Board of Immigration Appeals case in 1976. So once again, it's Banner Patel, 15 IN decision 666, Board of Immigration Appeals, 1976. Now, what are the factors that the judge is supposed to consider in granting the bond? Okay, the judge is supposed to look at local family ties, prior arrest convictions, your appearance at a hearing, uh, your employment or lack of employment, your membership in community organizations, your manner of entry and left of time in the United States, your immoral acts of subversive, subversive activities, your financial ability to post bonds, or any other types of factors. Okay, but the matter of Patel basically says when the judge, if the judge is faced with a situation where a judge can grant bond, which is individuals not an arriving alien, they're not a security, uh, threat and they're not subject to the mandatory detention under 236C, then the judge can, has the discretion to grant bond, but they have an actual separate hearing. And as an attorney, basically under Patel, you need to bring in all these factors to tell the judge why your client should be granted bond or why your client should be released. Now what I what I like to do is is I like to say that, or you've heard the adage that a um, idle hands is a devil's workshop. Y'all heard of that, right? If, if you, you have nothing to do, then uh, you're going to get into more trouble. So what I like to do is I like to take the employer of this particular person, put him on the stand, 
and basically have the employer tell the judge he's a good employee. If you let him out, I'm going to put him back to work. Okay? I like to put maybe some of the, the kids, I mean his children or her children's teachers on the witness stand. And they say, he's an active member of the PTO or PTA, you know, the Parent Teachers you know, Association. Um, I also like to, to, sh to put in the um, kids' uh, uh, transcripts because I have two kids that I consider them to be anchors, okay? So the thing is that my guy is going to come back to court, Judge, if you release him on bond, because my kids are going to school in, in, in this community. And I'm going to have to pull my kids out or, or to move the kids if I decide to run. Yes, sir? I, I'm curious. I mean, now, suppose you have uh, an arriving alien that's not a permanent resident. Okay. Uh, recent uh, cases where the employers were charged with federal offenses for hiring the, the undocumented person. How do you get the employer to come and testify I would employ him when, in fact, the person has no status here? Well, okay, I guess the I mean, question they're, is... They're getting themselves in trouble. Okay, that's, that's a good point. First of all, what I, and I would respond to is that um, the employer, although I don't want to get the employer in trouble, okay, the employer, first of all, is not going to be my client. Okay, I hate to say it, you know, if I have to burn the employer to, to, to represent my client, okay, fine. Okay, but I will tell you this, is that bond hearings... Okay, which is what you're going to be doing under the regulations as well as the act is not an evidentiary proceeding. Okay, and under the act and under the regulations, uh, there's no tape recording or there's no uh, recording of, or transcription of what happened. Okay, so the immigration judge can actually have individuals on the stand and testify from the stand, but there's no court reporter and there's no tape that's playing. So even though as an attorney I'm telling you that I might, uh, I will probably burn the employer at the expense of my client, representing my client, okay, I can still go and tell the employer and give them verse and page and basically say, if you want to go in, you can go in, but there won't be any transcription of it. I would also probably, you know, being an honest guy, you know, tell him, look, I'm not representing you, I'm representing him. But if you can get another immigration attorney to come and tell you, look, they can't record the proceedings, then maybe you're not going to be held liable for it. I know, worth a chance. That's what I'm getting at, yeah. Thank you. Okay, worth a chance. All right. Now, um, the judge can, once again, uh, uh, $1,500 is the minimum amount, which is the floor, so the judge is going to set a bond $1,500 or higher. Uh, in, in posting a bond, uh, you can only be a United States citizen or permanent resident alien to actually post the bond. Now, this is an uh, immigration attorney strategy. Uh, as an immigration attorney, uh, I would, and as a U.S. citizen, uh, I would never post the bond for a client. I learned the, uh, the hard way, and I'm giving you my mistakes, okay? So I actually posted a blog for a client one time, and I got a 1099 form at the end of the year. Basically, what happens when you post bond with the U.S. government, you actually make interest on the bond money. So the government sent me a 1099 and said, okay, now declare this earned, unearned income or this interest on your tax return. I was like, well, how do I do this? Because it's not my money. It's the client's money that they gave me to post on the bond, but I signed off as the obligor. So never again will I do that. But some attorneys in the city believe that the only way that they're going to get paid is that if the client shows up to jail, I'm sorry, if the client shows up to court, the money's going to come first to turn back to the attorney first. <coughs> And the attorney can take his pay on that before they give the rest to the client. But I'll leave that up to you. But I will not post bond for any clients anymore because it's, it's a uh, it's a tax headache. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure where like people who specialize in bonding. There, there are individuals that specialize in bonding. There are bonding companies out there, but I would not use any of them. They're a bunch of thieves. I don't know if any of you will work for them or heard of them, but for for a criminal bonding for a criminal bonding company. Basically, 
you usually post like 10%. So say the bond's $100,000, the bonding company loans you the $100,000 at a cost of maybe 10% or $10,000. So you don't get your $10,000 back. But if you show up, you know, the bonding company gets their 90000 and you just spent 10000 to use the bonding company's money. For immigration purposes, the bonds usually run from 50% on up. Okay, so say that you had a $100,000 bond, you go to a bonding company, the bonding company says, I charge a 50% VIG or premium, basically you lose 50000 okay, to borrow their money for maybe an eight month year. And then of course you as attorneys still want to get paid. So I always tell the client, never use the bonding company. Well, sorry, I'm, if I'm taking money out of your guys' pocket, if y'all are bonding companies. All right? I, I always tell the client, try to never use the bonding company. Get your power of attorney signed by the person in jail. If they have the authority to sell the house, give it to the spouse, sell the house, sell the car, do whatever you need to do, get, get the money to post the bond and get me out of here. But don't use the bonding company because you're going to lose whatever the, the premium it is. And if you show up back to court posting your own monies, you're going to get all 100% back. In some jurisdictional professor, uh, I don't know if it's anymore, but when I was in Massachusetts, Massachusetts do not, does not allow um, bonding companies for immigration purposes. There you go. You have to be cash. I don't know if they changed. It, 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 you couldn't go to a bonding company. It, it might be jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but there are there are uh, bail bondsmen here in Houston uh, for bonding for immigration bonds. And unfortunately, there could be situations where your client might not have another choice other than to pay that fifty percent premium. But that's a huge premium to get out. But you don't get a lot of one hundred thousand dollar bonds. I'm sorry. You don't get a lot of one hundred thousand dollar bonds in immigration. You, uh, you you might not get that much, but still, say if it's uh, say if it's twenty thousand, you have to pay a ten thousand uh, dollar premium. It's ten thousand dollars. You're not going to get back. Ten percent, you know, on twenty thousand, two thousand bucks might be a little bit more palatable. But I mean, to pay a fifty percent uh, premium, that's that's pretty steep. That's that's highway proper. Okay. Did I answer your question? Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. U.S. citizen or permanent resident alien, uh, you can post bond in any uh, immigration or homeland security office across the country. So I've had cases where family member, a loved one, is might be here as an H-1B, individual a non-immigrant. Basically, they can't post bond because they're not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident alien, but they have a family member somewhere up in Chicago that wants to post bond for your client who's sitting in a detention here in Houston. They can post bond in Chicago, get a receipt, send a receipt down here, and basically you can be released. Okay? So you don't have to post bond here. Um, when you do post bond, they don't want cash. It's only going to be money order. Okay. Now, for the most part, this first part of the lecture we've been talking about is pre-removal order, before that order of removal is actually signed by the judge. Okay. Let's switch gears. Say the judge signs an order of removal. Okay. Now this is going into uh, 241 of the Act, which is post-removal orders. All right. Now say that the judge signs the order, ordering your client removed and your client's in jail. Okay? Now, the government has 90 days under the act to basically send the client out, out of the country. Okay? So you have a post-removal, the client's in detention, I don't know, uh, send them to Jamaica or something like that, Jamaican nationality. Um, the government has 90 days to hold them before they send them back to Jamaica. Okay, so you can be held all this time prior to the removal hearing and post removal order plus 90 days on the backside. All right. Now, what is the government supposed to be doing during those 90 days? Well, they're supposed to be making arrangements with the, the hypo I'm giving you with the Jamaican government to actually receive the individual. The government, the individual comes in and says, look, I'm Jamaican, uh, you're going to deport me, send me back to Jamaica. So the U.S. government has to, uh, if the individual doesn't have a passport, the individual has to make application for the passport, 
and the U.S. government, with the help of your client, is supposed to facilitate all of this. Now, if your client is saying, look, I'm not going to sign on the passport application, you know, uh, cover his face, don't take my picture for this passport or whatever, um, those 90 days get wiped out. So your client is under an obligation to help the government official, U.S. government official, to make arrangements for you to be sent out. Now, I've been in the jail, it's been, it's a pretty bad place, of course I've never stayed there for a prolonged period of time. I've never been to Jamaica, so I don't know what Jamaica's like, but I would probably prefer to be in Jamaica as opposed to sitting in an immigration jail. But some clients will tell you, look, my wife is here, my kids are here, even though I had a removal order, I'll stay in this jail because they can come visit me on the weekends or whatever. But if I go to Jamaica, then I might not see them for a long time. So it's going to be up to your client. But still, if your client doesn't cooperate, then the 90 days doesn't have any meaning. If your client does cooperate, the government has 90 days to send your client out. Now, um, let me see. But I guess the point to make would be that there's no voluntary uh, departure at, after the, the judge is giving the order. Right. Once the judge once the judge signs the order, there's no voluntary departure. You can't leave on your own. So you're going to be stuck in there for uh, you're going to be stuck in there until the Jamaican government and my hypo saying, okay, look, he's a Jamaican individual. We'll take him back. And I, I guess as far as Jamaica's concerned, uh, or at least feasibility, U.S. government will probably get a plane to send him to Jamaica. For for Mexico, they got buses probably running like every hour on the hour. You know, they just put you in the bus and they'll just drive you across. But for Jamaica, or say you get deported to China, you know, they're going to have to actually put you in a plane to send you out. So that's the 90 days the government's going to... Well, you have to be careful. I mean, you have to be doubtful. If they're putting you on a bus to go to China, that means they really want to get rid of you. <laughs> <laughs> you <go. coughs> now, um, I, I should also make you aware of the fact that there are individuals that their countries won't take them back. Now, one of the countries uh, was, was actually Vietnam. Now, I'm not Vietnamese, I'm Chinese, but the thing is that I'm actually surprised in my lifetime, just a couple, couple, uh, maybe about a year and a half ago, Vietnam agreed to take all their nationals back. So, for example, say you, like, say you might be from Vietnam or Cambodia or from Laos or from Cuba or North Korea or wherever. You took them in initially, you were deported, we're not going to accept them back. Okay? You might have that situation. 90 days to send you out, the U.S. government, what are they supposed to do? They can't, let, can't send you back because the country's not going to take you back. Well, you might be an aggravated felon, you might have committed a murder or, or whatever, or you might be this horrible you know, prior criminal history. Well, we can't certainly let you out of the general public, right? So what the government initially took the position was that mandatory indefinite detention. Okay? So you, you know they send you down to Guantanamo or, or, or whatever. We can't send you back to your country of nationality because they're not going to accept you. Uh, we can't let you back out in society. Basically, we're just going to hold you forever. Okay? Now, I actually had a case like that where I had an Iranian boy, I said boy because he was young when he came into the country, but his parents immigrated to the United States, he graduated from UH, got a six-figure income, but about 20 years previous, he jumped the fence in hot Houston into an apartment complex to go swimming in a swimming pool. Okay? The landlord of the, um, the, the apartment complex, he was about, I think, 17 at the time, charged him as an adult, pled guilty to trespassing, got a one-year sentence for uh, probation, okay? He's an aggravated felon because he's committed a crime of, of violence. The circuit has basically said that trespassing, which is a Class C misdemeanor, which carries no uh, jail time, but it can carry one-year probation time, okay, um, is a crime of violence because it's a lesser-included offense of a burglary such that if you own someone else's property, there's the potential that you're going to injure the landowner or the landowner is going to injure you. So this could be a crime of violence. So this poor guy, you know, here he is in Houston, graduates, topless, toss, whatever, six-figure income, but 20 years ago he jumps, you know, to the apartment complex swimming pool and he's got a conviction for 
uh, a Class C tr misdemeanor trespassing, which he got a one-year probation for, he's committed a crime of violence, and now he's an aggravated felon. And now he's Iranian, and basically he's uh, subject to deportation, and the Iranian government, the U.S. government, don't, don't talk, so the Iranian government won't take him back. Okay, so now we got mandatory indefinite detention for him. Okay, now, now the thing is that um, there's a uh, Supreme Court case that that, uh, that came out. It's called uh, I can't. Even, it, I, I, did you cover Zavidias yet? Uh, we mentioned it, but okay, it's Zavidias. Z a d v y d a s. I don't know how to. I call it Zadivas. So. Zadivas. Z a d v y d a s, and it's uh, 533 U.S. 678. I don't have the this is what we'll do, Professor. If you give, we'll get together, you give me all these citations and regs, and I'll put them on the web page for them to read it. Okay. So basically, what they said that is mandatory indefinite detention is unconstitutional. Yay, something <laughs> works, right? Mandatory indefinite detention is unconstitutional. This actually gets into you know your your Hamden cases and all the uh, Guantanamo detainees and and things like that. Okay, but. Mandatory indefinite detention is unconstitutional without review. Okay, so what does review mean? Well, basically, there is a um, after Zavadias, the INS, the exec Executive Associate Commissioner, came up with this new sub agency. Okay, and the new sub agency is called the headqu it's at headquarters, but it's called the Post Order Detention Unit. Okay, so the post-order detention unit is basically supposed to review cases where you're subject to mandatory indefinite detention. Now, what that means is I don't know, but I think what it means is this. Your, your client's in the jail, the case file is closed, right? Your case file is closed, you're subject to mandatory indefinite detention. Every six months, they're supposed to open up your file and say, okay, should we let them back out into society? Or should we send him back to uh, to wherever he's supposed to go to, even though they're not taking him? Is there a foreseeable likelihood he's going to be deported? Well, if there's a unforeseeable if there's a unforeseeable likelihood that, he, that the country of nationality is going to take him back, if individuals not going to be a danger to property or person, then basically even with a post removal order, this unit can actually release him following the Supreme Court's decision. But then, of course, they can always say, we reviewed it, close the file, and every six months come back and open the file up again and review it again. Okay? So what time are you finish? Right now, right? About two minutes? Yeah. All right. Well, okay. I did my hour and 15 minute election. Good. Any two questions? Is, it, is that the reason why you still have so many Marilitos still in jail, even though after Sadivas? Yeah, yeah, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you want a minute? Uh, 236C. There was, there was a couple other exceptions. Okay, back to 236C. You're, you're, you commit these certain crime, criminal offenses. Um, there's, there's exceptions under, um, under, uh, under C2. Okay, if you're a witness and the prosecution needs you, basically there's an exception such that you can actually be released from jail. Okay? I had this young boy who was a uh, Trinidad and Tobago national. Basically, he was being deported for being having a uh, cocaine co cocaine conviction. So the cocaine subject him to 236C, which was the mandatory uh, detention. Okay. However, under 236C2, if he's a witness for the prosecution, the FOD can actually release him. Okay. What happens after you testify? Well, they can let him. They can. They can still let him out. Can they call him back and put they him back? They can call him back too. And jail. And, and now too. you don't have. Uh, right. But I had I had a situation. Uh, as far as the my story is that um, he had committed a burglary with his uncle, and the burglary with his uncle was pending when the government put him in the removal proceedings and put him in detention for the cocaine. Okay. And then, I don't know if y'all read in the newspaper, y'all should have read this one in the newspaper, but his uncle, in addition to the burglary, actually uh, took the boy's sister, I'm uh, oh, sorry, the boy's, I'm oh, sorry, the boy's mother, the boy's mother, his uncle's sister, 
okay? Took the sister, put her in the trunk in Houston, drove around for about three days, and she died from asphyxiation, okay? So what I did was I went over to the criminal prosecutor and I said, look, you have an open uh, burglary case involving the uncle and him as a co-defendant, and then you also have an open case where the uncle had killed his mother, or the uncle killed his sister, for first degree murder. My client's here to testify for you. <laughs> Please put him on your witness list. Can you do that? Yes. Put him on the witness list, I filed it in court, ran right over to the criminal court, got the witness list, ran right over to the file and said, hey look, even though he's got a cocaine conviction, statute says you can release him, because he's a witness for a prosecution, an open burglary case and a burglary case. Okay, Mr. Hugh, we'll let rule release him. How many immigration attorneys are there that do not understand this? I don't know. There, but there, there's, there's a lot of immigration attorneys who generally don't handle bonds in no. detention. They, they say that he's on bond, he, he's committed a, a crime, therefore no bond, goodbye, yeah, stay right. But there is an exception. It's a small exception. But as an attorney, you need to be the zealous advocate to figure out. Okay. Any questions of Professor Hugh? I thought this was excellent, Professor. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Give me a hand. Thank you. Thank you.